Yes. I wish to thank the organizers for, invite, for inviting me and um, also for setting me up in this uh, nice hotel not so far from the opera. I talked to a guy in the hotel and he said that some of the best hours of his life he owes to the opera. And I said, so you often go to the opera, don't you? And he said, no, but my wife does. <laughs> Somebody came up and said there's a typo in this um, <laughs> renaissance thing here, but there isn't. So this is recurrent neural networks, and I will talk more about that in the near future. That's, uh, again, to help uh, Ben Götzl pronounce my name. <laughs> and that's exactly the same slide that I used in 2009 when I gave my first and only AGI keynote in Washington. And, uh, for a while I was trying to, I played with the thought of repeating exactly the same keynote and wondering whether anybody would notice it. But um, there will be differences. Um, th deep learning is mostly about pattern recognition and I will also talk about things that go beyond pattern recognition, but let me first uh, emphasize the significance of pattern recognition through this little intelligence test. Um, there is a sequence of numbers here and I tell you in advance, there's a pattern hidden in the sequence. And the question is, what is the next number? And most people find that very difficult because the true answer is uh, 34, <laughs> because the nth number is this. <laughs> However, if you um, participate in a real IQ test and you you don't say 10, but 34, it may happen to you that you won't get the maximum number of points. And the reason is that everybody wants you to find the simple and fast solutions. This fast polynomial here, very simple, very short description, is much better than this one here. It's faster and it's, it consumes less storage, so you have more compression going on. And all of science, the history of science, is a series of compression progress events where you look at the observations that come in from the environment and suddenly you discover, hey, there's a simple law that explains all these falling apples which are all accelerating in the same way and so you have a video of 100 falling apples which means you can greatly compress it once you have this predictive program which is gravity which tells you how these orange pixels are moving from frame to frame which means once you understand gravity you can extremely compress lots of your observations. Not everything, but many of them. And all of science is a history of compression events and pattern detection is essentially the process of finding short and fast programs in the raw observations. And that's what babies do and physicists do and everybody does that. Now, before I come to automatic pattern recognition, let me uh, tell you about a pattern in the uh, which is related to this concept of a singularity, which many of you are familiar with. Uh, has anybody heard about the uh, singularity? Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe some of you also know that I don't like the word singularity so much. I prefer to call it omega, because that's what Teilhard de Chardin called it 100 years ago, this point in time where humanity will reach its next level. Omega sounds also much better than... Um, than singularity, a little bit like, oh my God. And, and most people who talk about omega or the singularity, they talk about recent accelerations of technology. How in recent decades and centuries, everything went faster and faster. But now I'm going to show you a beautiful exponential acceleration pattern which stretches back all the way to the Big Bang. And and which shows that from a human perspective, the most important events in history are converging around omega, is around 2050. So that starts 13.8 billion years ago with the Big Bang. And now we take a quarter of that time, and that's exactly the beginning of life, 3.5 billion years ago. And now I'm always going to take a quarter of the previous time, so we get a beautiful exponential acceleration thing going. We take a quarter of that time, that's exactly the first animal-like uh, mobile life. And we take a quarter of that time. 
And that's exactly 220 million years ago, the first mammals. And I have no idea why it keeps hitting these quarter points so exactly, but that's the pattern. Your ancestors, we take a quarter of, of that time, and it's exactly 55 million years ago with the first primates. And your ancestors, 13 million years ago, a quarter of that time, exactly the first hominids. And we take a quarter of that time, and things are getting really fast now, because that's when, when technology was invented, when the first stone tools were created, the dawn of technology, as nature called it, 3.5 million years ago. And we take a quarter of that time, omega minus 850,000 years, roughly when controlled fire, chemical energy, was, um, was used for the first time by humans to achieve goals. And we take a quarter of that time, that's exactly the beginning of modern man, people like you and me, and we take a quarter of that time, that's the behaviorally modern man, as he is called, 50,000 years ago, coming out of Africa, colonizing the world. And, and already shaped through the tools, for example, spears, which were known back then, probably shaped at least the shoulder muscles of, uh, of males. And we take a quarter of that time. I don't know why it, is keeping, why it keeps hitting these quarter points. Exactly the Neolithic Revolution, 13,000 years ago. Now everything is like a flash, because the first guy who built a wall and had ag agriculture almost was in space and built AIs. So the last 13,000 years is just a flash, but it has fine resolution in that flash. Um, we take a quarter of the time, that's exactly the Iron Age, and we are still living in the Iron Age. Look around uh, all these iron objects, and we take a quarter of the time when two important past inventions were combined, namely chemical energy and iron uh, to build weapons, like gun, uh, gun powder cannons and rockets, and that was invented in China around 800 years before Omega. This reminds me that uh, China often is accused of copying Western inventions, but the Western civilization is based on uh, Chinese inventions, such as paper, invented around Roman time, printing, invented around 800 after, years afterwards, gunpowder, gun weapons, rockets, and so on, and we never paid them a license fee. <laughs> and we take a quarter of that time, again, iron and chemical energy going together to build machines, uh, pretty sophisticated machines, and the Industrial Revolution is sweeping the world. And we take a quarter of that time, and that's now. Omega minus 50 years, more or less, the year 2000, information revolution, uh, digital nervous system covering the world, world wide, world wide web, cell phones for everybody. And then, of course, the next thing will be somewhere in the 2030s, and nobody knows exactly what's, what's that, what that is going to be because the future is hard to predict, as many people have learned through um, bitter experience, including my financial advisor. And, uh, and then we, we have a faster and faster sequence of infinitely uh, many additional revolutions, and it will converge around 2050. Now, one thing we can predict is that during that time, uh, computing power is going to get cheaper and cheaper, like it always has done, and we gain roughly a factor of 100 per computation time per um, euro per decade. Which means that once we have um, a little um, small computer with a, with, a human brain, with a human brain power, something like that we don't have yet, but soon probably we are going to have that, then just 50 additional years are necessary to get something that costs as much, but has the uh, computational power of all human brains combined. Um, 10 to the 100 to the fifth, that would be 10 billion. Now, um, without speculating too much what's going to happen there in the near future, let me now um, go to one ingredient of, of this future, which um, today goes by the name of deep learning, but which actually refers back to something that also dates back 50 years, uh, neural networks, deep neural networks, and, um, and I want to give you a, a quick overview of the history and the state of the art of that field. I wrote a, a big deep learning overview, which you can easily find on the web, uh, where there's a website just on that, 
and it has 888 references for some reason um, where you really get a comprehensive overview and it dates back all the way to the 60s, uh, this field of deep learning. Uh, recently I wrote a rather popular uh, comment about uh, a group of three people who call themselves the deep learning conspiracy and who cite themselves a lot but they don't really credit the pioneers also easy to find on the web and uh, the first pioneer of that field the father of deep learning was this guy here he was from Ukraine back then it was called the Soviet Union Eva Knenko in the 1960s he already had deep neural networks how many people know what is a neural network artificial neural network how many people do not know what is an artificial neural network? All right. Do we have a third group? <laughs> There's a superposition. And he had deep networks with inputs, input nodes, and then um, uh, first layer with uh, multiplicative and additive neurons. He didn't call them neurons, but that's what they were. And um, he trained them by regress re regression analysis. And then if that wasn't good enough, he created a second layer on top of that. And by 1970, he had deep networks with about um, eight layers already, which is deep by modern standards. And this worked, and many people used his methods still in the new millennium. That's pretty well-known stuff. And of course, he should be mentioned in any overview because he is the father of this entire field. Um, who came up with the name deep learning? Some people claim they invented that recently, but no, it's not true. Um, Dekta, in 1986, um, introduced the old term deep learning to machine learning in a paper which was referring to first order deep learning and second order deep learning, 1986, um, in, a, in, a, in a subfield of machine learning, which does not have much to do with neural networks. And the first guy who used it in the context of neural network, that was Eisenberg et al. Uh, et al. in, in 2000. Uh, 2000, uh, a book was written by, um, on, on um, binary uh, deep networks, and Eisenberg introduced that field. And since then, it has taken off. So that is a Google Engram viewer. Since 2000, the term has become more and more popular, deep learning. In 2005, my own group for the first time used the, um, the, the word deep learning in the title, or learn deep in the title of a paper. That was long after Eisenberg did it. Now, there's also, um, there are also a couple of myths uh, about who invented backpropagation. Does anybody know what is backpropagation? Backpropagation? Does anybody not know what is backpropagation? Mm -hmm. So backpropagation, for the few who don't know, is a method of taking a deep network and then um, all of the nodes are differentiable, and then you propagate. There's a difference between what the network does uh, as it is responding to the uh, input patterns that are propagating through this network and what it should have done. And this, this different le difference leads to an error function. You want to minimize that by computing a gradient with respect to that, uh, um, a gradient of this error function with respect to every single connection strength or weight in the system, and that is called backpropagation. And this uh, method goes back in its modern, modern form to a Finnish master student, Lina Inma, 1970. So that's uh, the first guy who published a discrete method of taking a differentiable graph with differentiable nodes, sparsely connected, and then propagating these errors back in the way that is called backpropagation. He should get many more citations. Lina Inma, 1970. And even before that, there were a couple of mathematicians, Bryson, Kelly, and Dreyfus, who had um, continuous backpropagation and continuous systems. But the modern thing that everybody's using now is the one that goes back to Linnaeinma, and then the first guy who applied it to neural networks was Paul Werbers um, in, in 1982, actually. And then there were experiments, uh, in, so in the, in the 80s, computers were 10,000 times faster than uh, in the 60s when it, the whole thing was invented, and uh, many people back then didn't even have access to computers, but in the 80s then, for the first time, one could see that you can really learn interesting internal representations, and there was a paper by Rommelhard and colleagues uh, in the 1980s about that. Now, this is, uh, this is Ron Williams and Paul Werbers. Now, here we see Lina Inma, and, uh, and interestingly, you see down there, the, the, the Bryson Kelly, uh, Dreyfus, Lina Inma published that right around uh, the time when uh, color photography was in invented. 
Just kidding. Now, the most important or the, the, the most powerful and deepest of all networks are recurrent neural networks. And that's where the RNNs come from, the Renaissance. Uh, who knows what is a recurrent neural network? Uh, who doesn't know what is a recurrent neural network? Mm -hmm. So it's a network where you have feedback connections. And these feedback connections allow the system to process sequences of inputs such that you can not only classify, for example, images or, um, or stationary data, but uh, you, can, you can process video and speech where you get 100 frames per second. And in the system itself, there are these circling activations, circling around these uh, recurrent connections, representing memories of what happened maybe a thousand or 10,000 steps ago which means that the outputs of your system can depend on stuff that came in a long time ago. And the, the task of the learning algorithm will be to come up with a weight matrix that learns to put the important things into memory and to ignore the irrelevant things. And these recurrent networks are general purpose computers. Anything that I can implement on this laptop, I can also implement on an on a appropriately wired up recurrent neural network. So the program of these recurrent networks are the weight matrices. And machine learning or recurrent neural network learning is about finding, finding weight matrices that solve problems such as speech recognition and whatever. In 1991, my first student ever, Sepp Hochreiter, figured out that uh, deep learning doesn't work. He, I had my, my first... Um, Deep learning project was in 1990, and my first student, uh, who is now a professor in Linz, he did a mathematical analysis of deep networks and showed that as you are propagating these errors back through backpropagation, they vanish exponentially, which means they get smaller and smaller, which means there is nothing uh, left if you propagate deep down, which means, especially in recurrent networks, where you have to propagate back for as many time steps as there are in the sequence that you are processing, uh, very little can be learned. Um, long time lags cannot be bridged in standard recurrent networks. Sepp Hochreiter, 1991, the guy who identified uh, in my lab the deep learning problem. And then our first approach was to uh, solve that problem using something that I call the neural history compressor, which has not only one recurrent network, but a whole um, hierarchy of neural networks where each of these networks, and now we are back to the theme of compression, where each of these networks tries to compress the incoming input sequence through something which is called predictive coding. And as you are getting a more compressed a description of the sequence, you send it up to the next layer where there's another guy which finds an even uh, more compressed version and so on in unsupervised fashion without any teacher who is supervising the whole thing. And then finally, the highest level in the hierarchy has such a com compact um, representation of the data such that the, the um, additional subsequent uh, supervised learning uh, becomes easy. And, and this unsupervised pre-training, uh, that's what we did in the early 1990s, but then we completely replaced that by purely supervised uh, recurrent networks, which in many applications just work much better than these unsupervised pre-training systems. And the key word there is the long short-term memory, which was uh, published in a journal in 1997. Has anybody heard of the long short-term memory? All right. Has anybody not heard uh, about the long short? Okay. Uh, yeah. So I say a few words about what that is. It's an the abbreviation is LSTM, and it's just a particular type of recurrent network architecture which makes it really easy to deal with um, long time lags in, in sequences such as video and speech. And it has a stupid sim simple trick, which is this little red guy here, which is a unit which has a, uh, which has a linear activation function. Actually, the activation <coughs> function of this unit is just the identity function. And Whatever comes into this unit is added to what's already in there, and then uh, ignore this uh, stuff up here for a moment. Then suppose that this recurrent connection here is 1.0, which means that whatever is in here from the one time step to the next remains as it is, unless something is added, which is coming in here. And, um, and now look at the derivatives of this. Well, if that is 1.0 here, and the um, activation function here is the identity function, then 
you always have to multiply by function as you're going backwards, as you're propagating arrows back in time, and because you always multiply by 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, nothing changes, which means you can propagate thousands of steps or tens of thousands or millions of steps back. And suddenly, with that little trick, you can deal with sequences that are really long, where you have to memorize stuff that happened a long time ago. Now, this would be just a linear unit, which is limited in many ways, and to, to, um, to overcome the limitations, you surround these linear units with a cloud of nonlinear units, which uh, are responsible for the nonlinear aspects of sequence processing. And these blue, uh, blue dots here, they are actually multiplications. And all these units, um, which surround the, the basic core of the LSTM cell, they are uh, exploiting the gradient signals, the error signals that are coming back through these red units, and they take them out there and use them to learn their own weights. So uh, these are the error transporters, and they go far back in time, and these other guys here do the linear, non-linear stuff, which you need to do to do decent speech recognition and whatever. And so uh, these LSTM cells, they have um, a long history now uh, from the 90s. Uh, Sepp Hochreiter, the first author of the first paper, then Felix Geers, who introduced something called forget gates, which many people are using now. I'm not going to into, into the details. Alex Graves, who was my PhD student and postdoc, who uh, came up with additional um, good improvements. Dan Biestra, so these guys, two guys are actually now at Deep, uh, DeepMind. Justin Bayer, Justin Bayer, who, um, who um, pointed out in 2009 that there are, now we are lost now, uh, who, point, who pointed out in 2009 that there are lots of different um, LSTM variants, which sometimes, um, where some topologies sometimes work better for certain problems and others for others. Uh, which means you can evolve uh, topologies through a method proposed in 2009, um, such that you have not only one type of LSTM variant, but many. And then in 2009, and this was when I gave my first AGI keynote, this was the state of the art back then. Uh, for the first time, a recurrent neural network really could win a competition, and that was handwriting recognition. And back then in 2009, we were proud that it was possible uh, by a recurrent neural network, which back then was kind of a, a toy problem method, because in the 90s we only had uh, very simple experiments with a million times slower computers, which uh, showed that in principle LSTM can learn things that other machines, such as hidden Markov models, cannot learn, but uh, we had to wait for faster computers until this really became a practical reality in speech processing and in, in handwriting recognition. And then uh, in 2009, through the work of Alex, this won three um, connected handwriting recognition competitions where you get a stream of uh, handwriting um, real values either through video or through um, pressure sensors. And from there, you have to solve the problem of not only uh, recognizing the letters, the individual letters, but also of segmenting automatically the entire input stream because no teacher tells you where does this handwritten letter end and where does this one start, where's the beginning of the U and where's the, where's the um, end of the L and so on. So the network has to segment and, um, and and classify at the same time, and it can do so through a method which is called Connections Temporal Classification, CTC, presented first time in 2006, where you, where you want to output a sequence of labels like T, O, blank, B, E, blank, willing to here, and so on, in response to a high-dimensional, um, long, well-valued input sequence such as video of this, of this, um, of this <coughs> handwriting. And uh, the same thing then could also work on um, not only on handwriting, uh, for French handwriting and Arab handwriting and Chinese hand uh, and, and uh, Farsi handwriting, and none of us speaks a word of Arabic. Um, but it also worked for speech, and by 2007 then, for the first time, uh, the system was able to um, overcome uh, problems of uh, hidden Markov models which were widely used in speech processing back then and outperformed standard methods like hidden Markov models on keyword spotting, keyword spotting. 
Do you know what is, who knows what is keyword spotting? So keyword spotting is you listen to telephone speech and somebody says, Al-Qaeda, and a red flag goes up. And uh, luckily this not only has military applications, but also industrial applications such as um, industrial espionage. <laughs> And today, uh, if you look at speech recognition conferences today, they are completely dominated by LSTM networks. Today, everybody is using LSTM networks for speech recognition after a sequence of improvements were obtained using LSTM recurrent neural networks. Um, Alex had, uh, in 2013, best results on Timid, which is a big um, speech corpus, and now Google and Microsoft and IBM are using that like crazy as the best um, hybrid system which combines an LSTM and an HMM is by SAC and uh, colleagues at Google and that is the best uh, large vocabulary speech recognition system at, um, at the moment. Baidu is also using, um, they had a big announcement of that uh, just a couple of months ago. They are using also these connectionless temporal classification methods that I mentioned before published in 2006 to um, break a famous speech recognition benchmark uh, record. So maybe some of you have heard of the switchboard benchmark. Has anybody heard of that? Speech, okay. And this is now also a recurrent network trained by CTC. And, and now there, I, I, I was so happy to see in 2014 an explosion of applications and of interest in these LSTM networks and there's a whole bunch of uh, world records that was achieved with LSTM recurrent networks. So I just mentioned the large vocabulary speech recognition that was done at Google. Then also translation, machine translation. You get English text examples, you get translated French text examples, you translate from English to text. How is that done? There's an LSTM network which takes the, the in incoming uh, symbols one at a time and translates that into an internal representation. There's another LSTM network which unrolls the internal ex um, representation into a corresponding French text, which is then the output. So the system has to learn just from the uh, training examples the nature of uh, English language and the hierarchical structure of English language and syntax and then uh, do the same thing for French and then learn how to go from English internal meanings to French internal meanings and enroll that into a French syntax. And the best current um, translation system, which is by Sutskeva and colleagues at Google, is using that approach to, to uh, improve machine translation. I remember Chomsky is famous, uh, has been famous for a long time for claiming that kids need something like a pre-wired grammar structure recognizer, something like that. But even our simple LSTM networks can learn all of this from scratch. So there's no need to assume that kids need a pre-wired structure that allows them to recognize speech better than other animals, for example. Then text-to-speech synth synthesis, that is when you read text and out comes speech, uh, such that it sounds convincing with an Oxford accent, uh, preferably. That is what Microsoft did. And then... Uh, Causality contour prediction, that's when you recognize the emotional context of speech. So speech signals come in, 100 frames per second, and then you have an evaluation of what is the emotional meaning of that, and that is also the best result. That was what IBM did there. Then a whole, kind, uh, a whole bunch of additional applications, parsing for natural language processing. So many people are now focusing on natural language processing. And whenever you look at these papers, you always will find an LSTM in there, which does that. Then uh, for to real talking heads, that is again Microsoft, which is using LSTM to make those guys. Um, image caption generation, I will tell you more about that. It's very interesting. Spotting. Video to textual uh, description, so you have a video and you want to have a text that explains what's going on in the video. Again, usually you have uh, combinations of traditional, uh, traditional uh, networks and uh, LCM networks to do that. Traditional networks are more limited, they don't even have recurrent connections, but sometimes that's good enough to do all kinds of um, vision tasks. And um, in, in 2010, for the first time, 
we could show that just a plain old backpropagation network, a multilayer perceptron, like the ones that Ivaknenko had in the 60s, trained by backpropagation, as uh, first explained uh, or written down by Lina Inma, um, and then in the 80s used by many people uh, since the publication of Romul Harding colleagues for training artificial um, networks. This old thing, this old uh, method with a deep network placed on GPU was able to outperform the traditional um, systems that were applied to the same uh, benchmark. And the only advance here was that, huh, that computers were faster and uh, the video game industry gave us this uh, cheap supercomputer, the, the GPU card, which was designed for simulating virtual realities and video games, but that's exactly the same type of operation that you need to um, optimize neural networks, matrix multiplications, essentially vector multiplications, and uh, that's how we can greatly speed up now these, um, these traditional old methods for backpropagation, and, uh, and uh, after 2010, everybody else uh, also moved, I think, from unsupervised pre-training, which was done before, to su purely supervised learning. So old ideas, but with faster hardware, suddenly yielded state of the art. And what you really should do if you have a feedforward network and you have a vision problem, you shouldn't use a plain backdrop network like the ones that I just had there, but instead you should use a convolutional neural network. Has anybody heard of convolutional neural networks? Mm hmm Does anybody not know convolutional neural networks? Okay. Mm hmm So. They go back to Fukushima, again, another old invention, 1997, 1979, uh, the, the first neocognitrons, and they always look the same. You have a convolutional layer, which has little neurons with uh, convolutional receptive fields, and you scan an entire image by those guys, and then you um, have weight sharing, weight replication, so the same, um, the same weight vector is used for all the elements of one of these um, convolutional layers, which means then you uh, basically apply a filter to the incoming image, and then you get a certain activation pattern, um, a 2D activation pattern, which is then fed, uh, fed into a downsampling method where you just, um, where you, under loss of, loss of information, downsample what you have seen so far, and this gives you a more abstract representation, and then this goes into another convolutional layer, another downsampling layer, another convolutional layer, and so on. And this was first done by Fukushima in 1979, and then Wang in 1992 replaced um, Fukushima's downsampling by something that is called max pooling. Has anybody heard of max pooling? Max pooling. So that goes back to Wang, 1992, 1993, and uh, Lecun and his team in 1989, but then also later, they were the one, ones who combined that with backpropagation and propagated through the entire convolutional network um, such that you could optimize through gradient descent the weights, which is something that neither Fukushima had done nor um, Wang had done. And then our contribution here was less fundamental than in the recurrent network case. We just accelerated all of that and parallelized it on uh, graphic cards. And the lead author there was Dan Girardin. And this then uh, led in 2011 uh, for, the, uh, for the first time to a system that could win the Chinese handwritten uh, written digit um, recognition contest where you have uh, thousands of symbols, 4,000 symbols, and then um, uh, a GPU-based uh, max pooling neural network that was first published in, in, at Ichikai in 2011 was the culprit and was able to win that. And the same system then could also greatly outperform all previous methods on, on the MNIST data set. So suddenly we had a, an improvement of uh, almost 50% on, on handwritten digits. And since then, it's basically dead. Uh, MNIST is too simple a problem now after having been uh, an important problem for decades. And, uh, and uh, also in 2011, then for the first time, we had uh, the first superhuman pattern recognition result using a, a deep uh, learning convolutional network like that on GPU in the traffic sign contest. Has anybody, can anybody at this conference recall the 2011 traffic sign contest? Uh, okay, uh, has anybody in this audience 
w was anybody in this audience also at the 2011 AGI at Google? Yes. Okay. Uh, just a few. Just a few. Because that, the way it worked, um, the contest was in Silicon Valley. It was in San Jose, maybe just a, a few miles away from Google headquarters, where then right afterwards there was the AGI 2011 conference. And um, this um, traffic sign contest was kind of interesting because first we had this, <laughs> first we had this qualifying, like in Formula One, first you um, could submit your favorite uh, machine learning algorithm or you could submit a system trained by your fa favorite algorithm to, um, to, to the organizers of the traffic sign contest and they had a secret test set and then they had a leaderboard and the top t uh, 10, I think, would get invited to Silicon Valley for, for the final contest. And there was, this, there was this qualifying and until right before the last day of the qualifying, uh, our team thought we have a comfortable lead, but then our competitors for, um, from the New York University, from uh, Jan LeCun's team, they, uh, they submitted another entry and was slightly better than ours. And then Dan and uh, Uli and Jonathan, they had to work uh, late night and submit yet another entry right before the deadline just to reestablish the correct order. <laughs> but then at the final, so and back then, people were overfitting on the test set already because what the organizers in the beginning didn't realize that if you repeatedly probe the test set, which is known only to, to the organizers, then you learn something about the test set, of course. So once they figured out what was happening there, they imposed a limit of 10 resubmissions. But then in the final competition, this was not possible. No, no, um, um, no repeatable trials or something. There was just one trial on the new test set, and this was easily won then by uh, the system where the lead author was Dan Girejan, and it was about twice as good as the second best, which were humans. And then uh, our uh, friends and competitors from New York University came in third, and they would get promptly hired by Facebook and by Google. And all of this is, of course, important for self-driving cars. And 2011, that was also this conference where the keynote was given by this guy. Uh, the AGI keynote was given by Ernst Dickmanns, who is living not far from Munich, and he is the pioneer of self-driving cars. And already 20 years ago, he had self-driving cars in traffic going from, from Munich to Denmark and back with up to 180 kilometers per hour and, uh, and automatically is passing other cars, safety drive on board, of course, for legal reasons and for construction areas and so on, but uh, um, often for hundreds of kilome kilometers, no intervention of the safety driver. So that was a, the guy who pioneered all of that and I'm sometimes I, sometimes I don't understand why Mercedes, uh, Daimler, is not emphasizing that fact, uh, that 20 years ago they already had a car, it wasn't really their own car, but it was Dickmann's car, but nevertheless a Mercedes, which uh, drove um, the first um, highway driving, uh, self-driving car. Much faster than today's self-driving cars, by the way. Dickmann's. I, th I think um, there may be one explanation why um, uh, Daimler is not uh, emphasizing that a lot because they have all these internal teams all working on that and, and there might, might be internal, internal profiling uh, efforts uh, associated with that. But then the same th thing could also learn to do very different uh, tasks, for example, segmenting brain images. That was a competition that um, our team was able to win in 19... No, in 2011, no, 2012, I think. That was the first image segmentation competition won by a deep learning network. And then the same thing also for object discovery and large images, which is important for medical diagnosis. That was in 2012, first object discovery uh, contest won by a deep learning network. Again, first author, Dan Girejan and um, Alessandro Giusti in my lab. There you get images of breast tissue and you try to find the tumor cells or the pre-cancer stage cells. So some of these cells, they, have, they, they are mitosis cells as they are called and they are bad cells and others are good cells and a trained histologist needs to look at this data and then 
um, decide for each of these little guys, is that good or bad? And I can do it, but our network learns to imitate the histologist by just imitating his responses and then works better than anything else on the, on the uh, secret test set in this competition. And this is of huge importance, I think, for many types of medical diagnosis uh, because <laughs> this particular application is so important. There was an, another uh, great application, the Grand Challenge, in 2013, and um, the same system was able to win that as well. Uh, so what we often see now in medical imaging is that we apply deep convolutional networks like that on GPUs to, um, to the data and we imitate the doctors who in the future will probably uh, be able to treat many <coughs> more patients with the same quality uh, than at the moment because um, it takes many, it takes a lot of time to look at one of these images and label all these cells, these bad cells and good cells. And to the extent that a machine can uh, help there, this will greatly facilitate the, the task of many uh, doctors, medical doctors. <coughs> so what you often see today, however, is uh, something that goes beyond mere um, image recognition where you where you have sequential aspects of information processing, and that leads me back to the recurrent networks that I mentioned in the beginning, which are deeper and more powerful than the feedforward networks. And what you see today is often that a convolution network is combined with an LSTM network. So you have a CNN front end for, for the vision which is coming in uh, through the cameras, and then you have an LSTM network which makes uh, temporal sense out of that. For example, if it's a video, then you get all these incoming um, um, images, frames, 24 per second, and the convolutional network is representing that internally as a per frame representation, which is much more compact than the original image, so you have compression going on, and then the, the sequence of these internal representations is fed into a uh, recurrent network, often an LSCM recurrent network, which then is, for example, trained to uh, generate text from the image. For example, here we've got an image caption application image caption generation application, and the first author is Vinyas. This was done by Google last year and attracted a lot of attention. You see an image like this one here, and it says, a herd of elephants walking across a dry grass field. And you look at the image, oh, that's pretty much what it is. That's what it is. So that a convolution, net convolution network sees the image, creates an internal representation, and the LSTM network has learn to generate a text, a sequential string of symbols from that internal representation, which then is the caption. And all of this only from training examples. It doesn't always work. Uh, for example, here we have two dogs play in the grass, but you look at the image, actually it's three dogs. And uh, two hockey players are fighting over the puck. Oh, it's not maybe, maybe they aren't exactly doing that, but it's uncannily accurate, sometimes at least. This is a mislabeled thing. Here it says, a yellow school bus parked in a parking lot. But it's also not entirely wrong, if you look at the image. And uh, to the extent that we can get more and more data and more and more processing power. Per decade, we gain a factor of 100 per euro or dollar. Uh, to that extent, we, at the moment at least, we are scaling linearly. So in 10 years, for the same price, we can do 100 times as well and have an, a, a big recurrent network which can not only do one task, but 100 tasks. And then 20 years more, we've got a factor of a million. We can even do rather sophisticated things, such as take a network and make a meta-learning machine out of that, which runs its own learning algorithm on the network itself. A weight change algorithm running on the network itself. I still have 15 minutes. OK, so I will do that quickly. In 1993, that was my first um, neural network-based meta-learner, which had output units. So this is a big recurrent network. 
And there you have output units of a standard kind and they manipulate some process in the environment, some robot or whatever, and then you get inputs from the environment and these inputs, uh, they are then seen by the internal uh, nodes of the network and you have a particular set of output units which, um, which are called the, the weight addressing units and the weight addressing units, they are outputting the address of one of these weights down here in the system. For example, if you have uh, a million weights, then one of them might have the address 520,612. Now this network here at time t says, now change the at weight at address 520,612, change that from um, its current value of 0 0.1 to another value of 0 0.9, rapidly, fast weights, very quick changes. And because it's a recurrent network and can run arbitrary algorithms, it essentially can also run arbitrary learning algorithms, weight change algorithms on its own. And we can train the whole thing by gradient descent. So we can train, because everything is differentiable, we can train the whole thing to learn a learning algorithm for itself, which is not only a learning algorithm for itself, but also a learning algorithm for the learning algorithm which is running on this network. And so you learn not only the way you learn, but also the way you learn the way you learn, and so on. A recursive self-improver in a certain sense. 1993, back then there was no LSTM yet, but uh, 2001, Sepp Hochreiter, whom I mentioned before, he had an LSTM network which was used as a meta-learner and it learned through gradient descent a weight change algorithm which was faster than background. Uh, on a certain limited class of functions on, on a set of quadratic functions. So it is possible to learn even learning algorithms running on these recurrent networks, on LSTM networks in, in particular. What you really want to do, however, is you want to, you want to do reinforcement learning. And this is what AGI is about. All AGI problems can be phrased as reinforcement learning problems where you want to maximize the future expected reward in an initially unknown environment and there's no teacher who tells you what to do at which time. And there, all this traditional deep learning doesn't work anymore because there you need reinforcement learning where there's no teacher who tells you what to do at which point in time. And in this particular application here, we have a reinforcement learner that is driving to dri uh, trying to learn to drive a car in a video game. And the there's a fitness function, a quality function, which says, um, sense which reflects until the crash. So the optimization procedure tries to find a weight matrix for a recurrent neural network which sees the raw video as an input, the raw video input stream, and it tries to come up with a policy that drives the car such that it goes as far as possible, accelerates, brakes, steers, just in time, without crashing. And so essentially, it has to learn to drive from trial and error. So there is no pre-wired system that does the vision. It has to learn the vision itself from scratch, just getting these very limited reinforcement signals. Either I'm better than the best system so far that we had, or I'm not better. So that's basically the information that it gets. Whenever it crashes, there's some information which says you did better than ever before or you, you didn't as well, do as well. And so you have a big recurrent network at which, which sees this observation stream which is generated by the system itself as it is driving through the race course. And from that it has to learn to adjust all these weights and there are a million weights here such that it learns to drive from nothing, no unsupervised free training, no, no additional help from the teacher. And that was the first uh, system ever who, which was able to take raw high dimensional vision and learn from scratch to, um, to drive a, a car in a video game simulation like that, or to drive any complex process or steer any complex process. Um, a reinforcement learning system which, took, which learned to deal with raw vision inputs even in a partially observable environment where you have to memorize uh, stuff that happened earlier to come up with a good action later. And it was 2013. Oh, yeah. Has, has anybody heard about DeepMind? I still have 10 minutes. DeepMind? Yeah. 
So DeepMind um, has deep roots in my lab, and um, what they so um, if you look at the so they are doing neural networks and artificial intelligence, and the first two guys at DeepMind uh, who are doing uh, neural networks and artificial intelligence were Dan Wiestra and Shane Legg, one of the co-founders, and, and they are basically setting the agenda. And they also had uh, recently a prominent um, uh, publication in Nature where they also learned from raw video to play video games. Uh, however, they were, their system was based on something from 20 years ago, traditional reinforcement learning combined with uh, neural networks and uh, 1994 for the first time uh, Tizauro had a system that a reinforcement learned backgammon and uh, the backgammon player back then became as good as the best human player in, in the world. That was uh, for a long time the main application of reinforcement learning where something really worked. Uh, how does, is, how does the whole thing work in this case? So this is using a recurrent network to deal with partial observability and, um, and maybe you, you know that if you use a standard search algorithm such as evolution to come up with a good weight matrix for this recurrent network which is doing the job of controlling, of seeing and perceiving the, the input sequences and previous action sequences and then uh, emit a sequence of action signals, of steering signals and braking acceleration signals and so on uh, to, to drive the car. You can imagine that um, if you have a million weights in the system, you, all these traditional methods do not work. And what we are doing here is something called compressed network search. Compressed network search, how does that work? Instead of having a, of, instead of searching directly, directly in this um, space of weight matrices, we search in a much smaller space of programs that compute big weight matrices. Once we have computed a big weight matrix, which has a million weights, as opposed to just a few um, bits of program, then we test it in the video game simulation, and there we get some result. And based on this feedback from the environment, you were better or not, we then um, keep searching in the small dimensional space of programs that compute these weight matrices. And the way to imagine uh, what's going on here is, imagine the weight matrix is an image and you use your favorite compression algorithm, wavelet compression, Fourier compression or something, to compress it down. And if you do that, then you um, get a series of coefficients that represent this big weight matrix. And if the problem is regular, which means that you have a rather simple rule for doing the right thing, then you, can, you will be able to greatly compress the weight matrix down the policy for doing what the system should do can be greatly compressed. Like in the beginning of the talk where the, uh, there's a simple explanation of the data, which is a simple polynomial, which computes all the data in this long sequence. There we have the same Occam's razor principle. You compress it down to just a few bits. In that case, the bits are actually discrete cosine transform coefficients. That's our program language programming language that we use to compute these large weight matrices. And there we then get um, huge compression factors. We get huge compression factors. For example, a, a good policy for driving that car through a network of about a million components has just 200 discrete cosine transform coefficients, which means we get a compression of 1 to 5,000. And the way this is reflected then in the weight is that you have a lot of weight sharing things or similar weights are used for many different connections and so on. But there's um, also quite some, some fine grain detail. And um, in any case, however, you have a, a fractal, if you will, um, decomposition of this weight matrix that leads to uh, good results. Now, I'm almost uh, finished. Let me just mention there won't be another neural network winter again because hardware itself, hardware architecture, future computers will become more and more recurrent neural network light because what is the future dictated by physics? You want to have a small volume with lots of small processors and they are connected by many um, short wires and few long wires. That will be the future of hardware even if the wires are light beams. 
And so this essentially looks very much like a recurrent neural network, which means that we will, <coughs> that the, re the RNN algorithms are going to become even more important. What you really want to do in the future is not what I just showed you, where you have just a, a one, where you have just one recurrent network that learns a policy for doing something. No, you want to have a world model, a world model that predicts what I, is going to happen if I do this sequence of actions, and then use this world model to plan. And, and this also goes back 25 years ago. You want to have a general purpose computer which takes inputs from the world, steers a robot that influences the world, and in that way you have a system that has both internal, internal feedback but also external feedback, and that is the controller that we had before. But in addition to that, you want to have another predictive world model, which is also seeing the sequence of ac uh, actions and observations, but it wants to predict what will happen next if you do that and that. And so this recurrent world model can then be used by the recurrent controller to optimize future action sequences, to maximize future expected reward. That's um, what I first published actually 25 years ago, 1990, two recurrent networks, one the controller, one the world model, which is, using the control, which is used by the controller to optimize performance. And this is a lot like AIXC. Who knows AIXC? Many people, that's great, that's great, because in AIXC, you also have a general purpose computer which makes predictions. And in a Bayesian framework, you will look at all possible programs that compute possible probability distributions according to which the environment is answering uh, your, your actions. And then you have another general purpose computer which essentially uses the predictions of the world model to come up with action sequences that lead to maximal predicted reward. That's what AIC is doing. And it's mathematically optimal, but it's not feasible. This thing here is not mathematically optimal, but at least it's feasible. You have general purpose wor world models, you have general purpose computers as um, action generators, and uh, you can use gradient descent and similar local search techniques to optimize the performance of the action generator such that you <coughs> maximize future expected reward. And back then, we had uh, selective attention methods uh, which were based on this principle, so we could learn all kinds of vision tasks with computers a million times slower than today. So I think, I like to think these were the first, um, the first um, reinforcement learning, attention directing models that learned for via sequences to find goals and, and sequences. And this has a lot to do with other stuff, and I don't have time for the, all of this. But uh, yes, it is true that artificial intelligence will change everything, and the future, the near future, will be, will be something like, um, and that's what I would like to achieve within the next few years. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, to take. something like a little cappuccine monkey-like intelligence. An, an AI with the intelligence of a small animal, such as a crow or a little monkey, and at the moment, we don't have that yet. What you already have is the, percepti uh, the, the passive perception aspect of, of learning, where you have, for example, a recurrent network that looks back in time and hierarchically decomposes through creation of internal units, complex <coughs> spatial temporal concepts uh, into, into their hierarchical constituents and so on. So that's what we see today in speech processing and natural language processing, LCM recurrent networks. There, we will linearly scale by a factor of 100 per decade or something. But what is missing still is a similarly efficient and practical thing which does the same thing into the future, which, um, which learns to generate um, small sets of possible sub-goals. For example, as the cappuccino monkey is discovering a little fruit on the palm tree, it realizes first it has to go to the base of the um, tree and then invoke a little subprogram that it has learned before, which is the climbing subprogram, and invoke another subprogram, which is then the gripping the fruit uh, subprogram and um, moving the fruit to your mouth uh, subprogram. And, and all of these things are done in a hierarchical way that focuses on the important subgoals in the future. So you have a hierarchical decomposition, abstract thinking going on, not only backwards 
in the like in the passive perception ca uh, case, but in the future active decomposition of your plan case. And that's what this little cappuccino monkey does all the time. Have you ever seen one of these little guys? They can do they can do everything I can do. I just can do more of it because I have more brain power. But they immediately see what is important for the solution of the current problem. They take the social context <coughs> into account. They see the other, other cappuccino monkeys and, and try to act as if there's nothing special going on up there in the palm tree uh, because they might be competitors. And all these uh, hierarchical planning um, and abstract thinking uh, processes they are already present in these little cappuccino monkeys. Once we have one of those guys, then it will take just a small number of years and we will have a human-like intelligence. Why is that? Look at evolution. Evolution needed billions of years for a little cappuccino monkey, but then a few additional millions of years to have um, a human-like intelligence. And it's not going to stop there. I should finally close with my disclaimer. We have a, a company that is interested a lot in building. It's one of the goals that we would like to pursue there, apart from the immediate industrial applications, um, where the goal is really to build something that it has the intelligence of a small animal, and we think uh, we will be able to achieve that in the not-so-distant future. I wish to thank the organizers again, for the invitation and for the check which I'm going to spend on my kids. And I wish to thank uh, my, my mom and my dad, without whom all of this would not have been possible. <laughs> and I wish to thank my kids, without all of them, uh, all, without whom all of this would not have been um, necessary. <laughs> and um, thank you for your attention. I think um, the biggest thing is the one that is currently not yet working well, which is this planning ahead thing. So there are models which plan ahead by using a world model, by simulating the future step by step, like you know, Monte Carlo sampling, you step by step, you simulate into the future, or um, also what I mentioned there 25 years ago, where you uh, look at all possible futures, simulate them step by step, do gradient descent in the set of possible futures, essentially, such that you get back a gradient signal for the controller who is, who is um, uh, computing the action sequences leading to the goal. What we are doing, uh, humans and uh, cappuccino monkeys, is we just, we, based on our previous experience, we know there are just a couple of important sub-goals, and this one is 10 seconds in the future, and this one is maybe... Um, 10 minutes in the future, and that's in between. I know how to go from A to B and to invoke this sub-program, which finally will lead me to the final goal. So um, there has been work along these lines, and there is um, uh, lots of work in the 90s, um, not only by my own team, um, people like Marco Biering, hierarchical queue learning, the option framework, uh, which doesn't learn, however, which is just a framework. How and complex were the environments that these systems yeah, I think they will be as complex as those that we are dealing now in the perceptive, um, in, in the perception case. So this means rather complex. Huh? But so these past examples were in much simpler environments? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. But uh, it's also true that um, many of these studies date back to a time when computers were huh, at least 10,000 times slower than today. And we have seen that much of the, many of the methods of, um, of the 90s suddenly with faster computers are much more successful. And so, yes, we will have a high resolution simulation, for example, of environments where little <coughs> cappuccino monkey-like intelligences are going to prosper. Uh, why, the, why not work directly with real robots? Mostly because real robots are so fragile and I'm personally much more impressed by, um, by the mechanics of fingers of cappuccino monkeys as opposed to um, the intelligence part, which 
which we think we almost we we are almost there. I don't understand how to how to build a self-replicating, self-healing robot body. I can understand how a future robot civilization will have lots of um, factories and as a whole will be able to self-replicate because you will have um, factories that produce these parts of the robots and these and collectively a robot civilization can then multiply itself. I don't understand at all how to recreate the stuff that nature is doing all the time where you have a trillion cells in your body and each of them in principle has all the information about how to, how to, um, how to unfold itself into a new being. So the mechanics uh, of biology I'm much more impressed with than the mechanics of intelligence simply because I, I, I think we almost understand the mechanics of intelligence but I personally at least don't Maybe see that's how just to you're a computer scientist that's than a biologist. I agree, yeah. I agree. Yeah. That is one thing. Yeah. However, it's also interesting to see. It took really billions of years to come up with the mechanics and just a few millions of years yeah. to have some intelligence on top. So one more reason to be less impressed by the intelligence part. Yeah. Uh, additional questions? Tony? Uh, well, first let me thank you for a very entertaining uh, talk. Well, thank you. Um, my question is around um, training versus online uh, uh, neural networks. Uh, my understanding is that uh, to train it, it's, it's not usable whilst it's being trained. And then, then when you want to use it, you stop training it, um, and then you can use it. Um, is there any progress in combining training whilst online? Um, because in a, real, in a real world environment we want an AGI to be on and not have to become offline to learn to adapt to its, its most recent set of inputs. Hmm. Um, it can only be trained on what's happened in the past uh, currently. Um, so is there any way of, of combining um, the training phase with its online phase so they become the same thing so we can actually adapt to, to yeah. live training data? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, there has been a um, long tradition of um, research on something that is called transfer learning, which is related to what you are saying, uh, where you um, first learn on one data set and then later new data comes along and then you kind of reuse what you learned before on this first data set to facilita facilitate training on the second uh, set and so on. Um, most of this work is done less in an online fashion that you uh, are referring to because usually you, you really have um, these clear separations between training phases and, um, and application phases, just because you want to make sure that the new data is not overriding and um, um, yeah, is not overriding the previously learned skills and so on. Um, however, in general, you, you see that this is possible, and um, for example, uh, the, the uh, Chinese handwriting recognition works much better if you first pre-train your system on European symbols or the other way around. Why? Because all of these symbols um, use feature detectors which are kind of similar. E edge detectors, Gabor-like filters in the periphery, they are always reinvented by these networks and then um, also more complicated, higher level feature detectors. And then often all you need to do when you have a new training set on top is take the first fifth, five layers of the old uh, system, which already knows to deal with one language, and just rather quickly add or change a few weights on the top level such that you also can deal with the new data. And that you, you will see great speed ups over, um, over systems that learn everything from scratch. Uh, but um, what you are probably really interested in is something that never makes a difference between learning and training phases and so on. And, um, and I think to achieve that, uh, you, you probably need something like what I, what I call power play, where you, where you don't have... So I didn't talk about that because I didn't have any time. But there you have a sequence of tasks which um, is absorbed by a learning system of the type that you describe. And then each new task is somehow building all the previous knowledge in the, in the, in the system and the previous skills in the, in the system. But then the challenge is to make sure that no previous knowledge is ever forgotten. And this is what the power play is about. So it's about, 
inventing new tasks, self-generated, explorative tasks that uh, tell the system better how the world works, but then under the constraint that none of the previous knowledge goes away, is overwritten. And there are ways of doing that in a way that is not too expensive because as you are, for example, looking at a system that now has learned one million different skills, you, it looks as if it is going to be more and more expensive to make sure that none of these previous one million skills will be violated or um, um, uh, will suffer from, new, from this one new skill that you add on top. And the way to deal with that um, problem is to keep track which of the connections that you are changing in your system are affecting which tasks, such that you, um, that you make sure that you can still be efficient because you have to retest performance, for example, only on those um, parts of the system or only on those tasks where you know they might be affected through the current changes of my, of my policy. And I could talk for hours just on that. Yes. Thank you for the exquisite talk. Um, my question is about uh, data representation models of the world, complex ones, for example, objects and attributes yeah. or um, with complex values or with um, complex world states like the capuchin monkey who might deal with specific uh, positions of, of the fruit he wants to get, um, like a little bit in the space between the symbolic AI and, and, and state spaces, world states, and, um, and the, and the neur neural AI. So um, can you represent these complex, let's say, attribute value uh, maps? Um, can you perform search in, in like um, planner type uh, uh, large and complex um, state spaces. Yeah. Yes. In principle, that can be done because a recurrent network is a general purpose computer. And so any program that you can run on, on your favorite um, machine, in principle, can also run on a parallel sequential recurrent neural network. So in principle, it is possible. And the question is then always uh, how practical is it in applications? And we see as we are getting faster computers, more and more of these more symbolic um, manipulation tasks uh, where you have to search among objects or so uh, to come up with a pr uh, good answer to the current question are becoming feasible. So I would say um, probably there is no need to pre-wire all kinds of ontologies and, and other structures into your um, recon neural networks. Maybe it will help you to facilitate the task, but in the long run, I think all of that is l learnable. And this little capuchin monkey is going to learn the relation between attributes of its objects that it's dealing with, and there are red fruits and blue fruits and, and uh, fruits in general, and, um, and there are ways of dealing with certain types of fruits, and some of them, they are um, soft, and others are hard, and there are different procedures for dealing with those, and so on. So, it will be able to organize all these different um, skills that it needs to deal with these different perceptions in one big system. I think it will be possible. It will be rather simple and elegant in the end. But did you have cases already? Did you have um, uh, implementations of such attribute value um, sets? Did you observe them? Or yeah. do you have an intuition that they might be there? So. When you do a speech recognition, for example, or language processing, all the time you have something like that because the internal representations of the LSTM network, which is decomposing the sentences which come in into noun phrases and verb phrases, it's essentially doing what you're saying. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Maybe uh, one or two more quick questions and we gotta go on to Yesterday we had a talk uh, by Ben Goetzel on uh, pathologies of current deep uh, learning. Mm. Uh, could you give us some comments on this criticism? Is that like uh, random images recognizing uh, objects in random images or uh, being not robust uh, against small perturbation? Yeah. We, we were discussing various recent yeah. papers that, that we've all seen where yeah. CNNs will 
recognize some random looking dots as being a, yeah. a, a pig or a cow or we change like 1% of the pixels in your face, it can't yeah. recognize you. And so yeah, yeah. If I, are these just peculiarities? Are they exactly those CNNs that are set up? Or do they yeah. indicate something more incorrect about the internal representation inside these yeah. particular deep networks? Yeah. Yeah, we, we have played around for a long time uh, with all kinds of systems where you do exactly that. You do gradient descent in input space, such that you get something that cannot be classified correctly anymore. Or where you, for example, represent, say, a technique like uh, random deletion of units or dropout or something like that uh, can be simulated. It's a, it's a form of data augmentation where you can um, simulate the same result um, through a new image which you get in there which uh, corresponds to the absence of a certain internal feature which you kill through dropout or whatever. And so um, it is kind of clear you will end up with uh, images, how you can derive images that will kill the um, generalization or that will lead to misclassifications. You just, you have a chance of looking at the details of each um, part of the system and you just come up with an, with a, an example that um, is designed to be misclassified. And this will always be possible. Uh, just like uh, since the beginnings of time, uh, or uh, beginnings of computer science at least, uh, Gödel uh, came up with uh, sentences that no matter what is the axiomatic system that you have, they always will have the property that they are unprovable. Uh, even if they are hopefully true, otherwise mathematics wouldn't work, or would be fundamentally flawed. So no matter what kind of complex systems you have, on some level, you always will find um, fundamental, um, it, it will find counterexamples that will go beyond the capacity or the capabilities of that system. In general, however, uh, in practical applications, it will be just a matter of having more training examples and bigger networks uh, to, to overcome these particular problems. And in the end, what you want, you want a system that can deal with the typical environmental inputs and you don't want one or you are not interested in one in, in, in a system that wastes resources on dealing with uh, stuff that is not important. So, training examples and uh, training experience is shaping a system towards a certain direction. It's biasing it also in a certain uh, way but that's okay because you want to bias it towards a particular environment which has certain properties that you want to exploit and then if another guy then says, yes, but I have a theoretical counterexample that, um, that shows that your system isn't really uh, general, so be it. It always has been in, like that in computer science. So I'm not too worried about that. So. Yeah. Thank you for the really interesting talk. Uh, you might wish to uh, address this offline, but I, some other people might be interested. Um, you briefly mentioned your critique of the paper that came out by um, uh, Lacun, Benji, and Hinton, yes. which sparked a really interesting debate online regarding giving credit in academia. Uh, just wondering if there's been any latest developments in the debate or if you found the common ground. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, I think what had been, what was said had, had to be said and um, it's, it's kind of clear because what you have to do, you just look at the published record and, and there it's, it's all obvious. You know? So it's also kind of clear who is right and who is not right and so <laughs> <laughs> don't really, don't really, exactly, <laughs> enough said kind of. Yeah. Thank you. Well <laughs> all right, well yeah, th thanks for... Uh,